I see uh, the Teacher's Point of View podcast. And uh, obviously, it's so exciting to have you on. You've um, had, had 20 years experience plus in, in the industry, haven't you, teaching? And uh, obviously, been on a bit of a new a new journey recently. But I mean, why don't you introduce yourself and kind of who you are, what, what got you into teaching and what, what you're sort of doing now? That'd be great. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Steve Carr. Um, what got me into teaching? So I came into teaching quite late in life. I came into teaching in my early 40s having had a, um, a career in the film and media business. So I came into teaching, I think when I was 40, 41, which actually uh, was really interesting. That says something about my age, doesn't it? So and that's uh, nearly 20 years, so do the maths. Um, yeah, so that was quite an interesting time to come into teaching because I had quite a lot of industry experience. You know, I'd worked as a, um, you know, a managing director of a company. So I came into teaching really um, wanting to sort of give something back in a way. You know, I had a quite a successful career out of teaching and I uh, had a really uh, transformative experience at school myself. You know, school for me was an amazingly uh, transformative in so far as it was a safe place to be. It was a place where for the first time in my life, anybody said to me, you know, Steve, what do you think about this? Tell us your opinion. Uh, and it was really a place where I felt like uh, I flourished. I loved, I loved going to school. Um, I went to some very difficult schools when I was a kid uh, in the Midlands. Uh, by no means was it uh, was it a uh, privileged environment, but actually there was something about it which was really uh, really good for me. Um, so you know, when I got to when I got to kind of my late thirties, early forties, I kind of thought, well there's something calling me into this profession uh, and I'm, um, you know, it did something for me and I know I have a sense that I can um, give something back if you like. So that's what led me into it. And I think what happened next was really interesting. So I came into it thinking that actually it would be a very uh, structured environment in terms of, um, in a way I thought it would be much more of a grown up environment in a way. And that's not a judgment on the way, uh, that's not a judgment on what people do. I'm not here to judge anyone. But at the same time, you know, when I encountered quite a few sort of behavior management things personally at that age, particularly at that age, you know, why weren't the children listening to me? Why weren't they interested in, you know, what I had to bring? What was it about, uh, you know, a classroom environment and a school environment that sometimes in my mind led to, um, you know, uh, a lot of disruption. And for me, that, that actually led me on a very personal journey about, you know, well, what is it that's happening in the room? What's happening in the classroom? What happens when I come in with this thing that I call the lesson? Uh, and what happens when I try to kind of deliver that lesson to the students? Um, and I had a lot of very unsuccessful times at the beginning of my teaching career. I've got to be really honest, really struggled, really difficult times. And uh, I, I think that's what makes me incredibly empathetic to teachers now, that actually teaching, particularly at the beginning and, and often throughout one's career, is tough. It's a tough thing to do. It's brilliant as well, but it is certainly when you first encounter um, a class in a state school. Uh, I'm not sure. I've never taught in the private sector. My understanding is it's it's different for lots of reasons. When you first encounter a class that actually says no in the way they kind of respond to you it can be very challenging as an adult so that led me on a journey of thinking well what's going on here what's really happening and I think being older my expectation in a way was higher and I was less willing in a way just to follow the line of well don't take it personally um and, and some of the more um uh, how can we say some of the more sort of simplistic ways of thinking about behavior uh, I, I actually thought well there's something else happening so that led me on to uh, a journey of six years seven years uh, relationship psychology training um, particularly uh, at the beginning very much focused on uh, emotional as aspects of learning and teaching what's happening in the emotional exchange uh, what are children reading when they when they kind of uh, read you and read what you're bringing uh, and the emotional impact really of decision making within all of that and the place of kind of fear and anxiety the place of 
um, con uh, connection and creating good relationships. So uh, I did that uh, very much focused on schools initially and um, latterly uh, thinking about whole organisations and how does um, the interplay and the interconnections between people really influence what goes on um, um, both in classrooms. Classrooms are a fantastic sort of microcosm of an organisation um, and both in the bigger picture. So from there I did a couple of master's uh, degrees in uh, relationship psychology and from there um, I began a couple of years ago um, setting out my own to sort of feed that back into into education if you like and I've, I've produced uh, a couple of courses that I've been teaching uh, since then uh, one called a mind to teach which is all about relationship management and uh, I've worked with SLT groups and other groups helping them think about, well, what's happening in the interrelationship between you and your staff and helping teachers think about what's happening in the interrelationship between you and your students. And how can you use some of the tools, some of the psychological, simple psychological tools to uh, actually make that experience not only better for you, but a greater learning experience for kids in the room and a greater experience for staff in your school. Um, because actually it's not rocket science but it does take kind of focus and commitment if you're serious about uh, going on that journey, which I think many teachers are, because actually if you don't go on this journey where you're thinking about the personal aspects of what you're doing, you can go down lots of rabbit holes and things can get very difficult for you. And what, what I've found is just by thinking very straightforwardly about what's happening in that relationship, you can just free up lots of your attention again and you can begin to focus on what's important and start having a better time, you know, um, in the room. Um, so, yeah, so that's, what, that's what's got me to where I am right now, if you like. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, of course it does. Obviously, you, you picked up on, you touched, touched on, obviously, behaviour. It's obviously a massive thing, especially in the, in the UK, where maybe schools are in deprived areas or, where actually, they can even be in affluent areas, but there's, there's a lot of times where children are misbehaving, and that's, that's one of the teachers' biggest struggles at the moment is behaviour management, isn't it? And um, for a lot of schools, they've actually tightened up on it quite a lot. Um, what, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think, like, the behaviour is, is the way it is in the UK? And why do you think it's got the reputation it does? Well, I think there's lots of reasons for that. I think there's a basic misunderstanding sometimes around uh, a teacher's role in the room. I think that's one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges. I think teachers are uh, encouraged to, to think of themselves as kind of fully grown up adults who are going into a room and they're taking charge of the students in front of them. Well, that, that's a misconception straight away. Actually, the children in front of them, the children in the room, they bring something into the room and the adult in the room actually has to kind of take charge of themselves before they can take charge of the kids in front of them. So it's that, uh, it's that kind of dynamic that needs to be understood. So why is behaviour the way it is? Well, there's an awful lot of kind of cultural pressures aren't there right now and there's, there's an awful lot of, um, you know, there's this, there's this, as I say, there's this misconception, I think, that somehow you know children should do what i say children should behave the way i want them to and if they don't behave the way i want them to then the answer more often than not seems to be well let's kind of put a lid on them more let's try to kind of repress them more because there's a fear i think of uh, there's a fear of children who are misbehaving and it's that kind of fear that can get out of control in a room that actually can lead actually then to behaviours in that room that can make behaviour worse. Uh, and I think at the moment there's, you know, I'm not, I don't know, I've not worked in every school in the UK, but I think from what I've experienced, um, there's, a, there's a sort of, a, the schools are a bit of a loss sometimes to, to understand what's really happening uh, in that relationship between uh, teacher and pupils. Um, yeah, and I, th I think the other thing is that students have got a voice. You know, they've got much more of a voice than they had. You know, they're, they're much more exposed to social media. A lot of, a lot of children, I think, see teachers as um, sort of an add-on to what they can find out via, you know, via social media, via Google, via search engines. And what is the role of a teacher in, in that, uh, in that um, you know, if that's, if that's the model? You know, what is he there? What is he or she there to do? 
And do teachers really understand that role? Um, so yeah, it can be very difficult. And the other thing I don't, but the other thing I don't agree with though is, you know, people say to me, oh, you know, it's interesting, Steve, because behaviour used to be so much better. And I, you know, I went to a comprehensive school um, in the in the seventies, and it, it, it what, you know, I can guarantee you that it wasn't better then. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely tore teachers apart in those days, in the same way that I've seen classes try to do that to me and to other teachers and there's there's something going on in human nature that uh, is not quite understood um, so I, I don't quite buy that actually it's worse now than it used to be I'm not sure that's true I think there's an awful lot of pressure on on the system now because of exams and the way the system is kind of set up but at the same time uh, I you know if lockdown has taught us anything about about um, kids in school is that they for the most part most children want to go to school they want to go to school it's where they see their mates it's where they see uh, it's where they're able to kind of socialize um it's where they have a kind of their own personal identity gets to be actualized children like school uh, in my view That's, and i think it's a misnomer and a and it's, a, it's a, another misconception that actually, in a way, we've got to force them to learn and force them to, to you know, to knuckle down and get on with it. Uh, in my experience, children, for the most part, like being at school. They like being with their mates and they like being in the classroom. But it's, uh, it's, a, matter of where, uh, uh, it's a matter of how that's handled. Um, and initially, in all relationships, it's difficult because people are sussing each other out. So... Yeah, uh, and behaviour management is a massive thing for teachers. I totally acknowledge that. Yeah, uh, it's um, it's interesting you say that. Obviously, you're right. I mean, when I was at school, and that was like 10, 15 years ago now, um, it, it was pretty bad. I mean, not I wouldn't say all of us. I mean, but there were still some naughty kids, you know. I mean, like behaviour is, it was bad. I think you're right. I think there is more pressure on like teaching staff and schools now, just in general, because um, they expect like so much. I mean, there's so much more that's involved in terms of data entry and like you, you're doing much more that's outside of actually just teaching, aren't you? Um, there, there is a lot of pressure. And um, I mean, why, why do you think that's changed? I mean, what's changed over the last 20 years and why has it become so much more pressurised? Yeah, that's a good question. I think when I first started teaching, uh, yeah, best part of 20 years ago, um, you know, there was a, you were sort of given the, you were given the curriculum, you were told who your class were, and you were asked to kind of go away and prepare the lessons and go in and teach those lessons. And of course, there was kind of an outline of what you should teach. But in a way, it was left very much uh, to you so once the door was kind of closed you were in it, it was your gig and, and I think it's still like that to a certain extent I think in my time in teaching what changed was that actually um, it became much more centralized so lessons were planned from the center when I worked in a very busy uh, English department and that went from me planning my lessons and kind of delivering them to a whole shift towards, well, all lessons now are gonna be planned at center and you're gonna teach uh, the lessons that you are told to teach in this order. So once that happens, and I, I, you know, good reasons for that, don't get me wrong, there are good reasons for that because actually then you're able to, uh, you know, you're, you're able to kind of create a benchmark and, nor and you know, so that you can all sort of go well, you know, you can benchmark it anyway. So, but what that does do is it sort of takes away the teacher's individuality and personality from, from the job. And, and, and we begin to treat teachers like machines, as though they are kind of like data entry providers in a way. You know, the teacher goes into the room just to download what they, what's been uploaded into them by, you know, by, you know, by the centre. And then their job in a way is just to not really think about too much about it but then to kind of download that data into the children so once you start doing that you can treating teachers in that way as kind of machines in a way you can then begin to kind of load more into the machine well this machine now needs to you know uh, think about data it needs to uh, do all sorts of things and 
again, you know, I don't want to criticise that too much. I get the use of data. I understand that actually data is very important, but it's kind of like there's this thing that runs through education, I think, is, you know, we do things, but actually we're not quite sure why we're doing them. And once you take away the why someone's doing something from somebody, once they don't get why it is and they don't kind of buy into it, then actually it becomes very burdensome to do these things. It becomes very, um, you know, you begin to slightly, you're not sure what's, you know, you have to, but you're not kind of, kind of quite sure why and you're not quite buying into it. Now, now those things can be alienating for anyone and they can mean, it can mean actually to a greater pressure on your, on your personality, if you like, because it's not you that's needed in that room. There's a notion that anybody in that room would do. So I think that's, um, I think that, you know, I think there's two things going on there. There's like a, like a, like a, a dehumanization, if you like, and that's, a big, that's quite a strong word to use, of the teacher themselves. And then there's like a loading onto them as though in a way they're just sort of data and um, unit managers. Well, all of that is depersonalizes the whole joy of teaching, which is in creating relationships with students. And, and that's, that's what's the fun of teaching. That's what's great about it. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, and that becomes alienated in a way. That becomes secondary to the jobs that, you've, that you have to do. Uh, and that's very stressful because there's, there's no room for that in your own kind of, for your own personal expression. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's, yeah, from like, even just somebody that's not a teacher, like so, I'm sort of hearing what you've just said from an outside like, point of view. I mean, I think there's like, the first thing that kind of, the red flag that raises for me is, um, if it's centralized the way it is, they don't know the students as well as the teachers know the students and they don't have the same level of rapport. So how can you like kind of, like sell yourself and get them to buy into you when you're not being you, you know? And I think that kind of takes away that element. And I think, I mean, I'm, like, I work in, I've worked in like sort of customer service relationship orientated roles for, for the last eight years. And a big part of why people use me is because of me, you know, like they, they buy into me and they want to trust into me. And even like my reputation, like my, my the, the company that I own, the biggest, my unique selling point is me, you know, like as teachers, your USP is you. So what, and, and it needs to be tailored like to your students because of the way that you know them, you know? I mean, so that's a massive red flag for me. Like, I mean, what, what I mean, why, why is that the case? Like I, I get, obviously it is great for data, but is it the best for students? Well, I mean, you put the nail on the head. I think it's, I think what, I think, I think you're absolutely dead right that when successful teachers are successful at creating relationships, that, that, at the end of, there's no other, there's no other, I, I would challenge anybody to say that um, you can be a success as a teacher if you don't create relationships with students where they buy into you as a person. Uh, and they may buy into you as a person because you're really good at your, you know, your expert knowledge of maths is great. And they might go, well, this guy really knows his maths, you know, and he's really kind of into, give, into kind of telling me how maths is good. So those students are buying into maths, but actually what they're really buying into is your kind of passion for the subject and your ability yeah. to deliver it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's you that, they, that they're interested in. It's, it's, it's the teacher. Uh, and and that's, that's always been the case, and that will always be the case. But what's happening, I think, right now is there's sort of a denial of that going on. And that's, that, and talking about red flags, that's an enormous red flag for me. Because how can you, in a, in a system that is all about kind of interrelationships, deny the kind of the, uh, the individuality and the personal kind of attributes of the person going in? And in doing that, you have to help that person understand what their challenges might be. What might be my personal challenges going into this room? And how can I really work with those within the system? Rather than when I have those challenges, sometimes the system can turn around and go, well, that's not really to do with us. That's your problem. Well, that's really short-sighted in my view. So there is this kind of drive towards data and you know from even with my psychologist hat on the drive towards data is is not is not bad don't get me wrong I, i'm not I, you know i don't want to ra wave a red flag in in front of a car and say you know machines are coming let's all worry it's not that data is useful 
but it's what are we using the data for? Why are we interested in it? What's, how can it help us build a good relationship with students? How can it help us kind of facilitate something that's human? And I think that's kind of, I think that's missing. And, you know, and, I, and I, again, from the psychologist's point of view, there's a thing called denial. And you can, you can kind of push something away because actually it's, you feel it's too much to look at. And I think to a large extent, education doesn't really want to look at the, person that the, the personality of the teacher in the exchange. Mm. They feel that that is, is too difficult to look at. And, and I, I would disagree with that. I think actually that is what kids like. That's what they buy into. They buy into the person. So let's think about and talk about the people. I agree. I mean, if Gavin McCormack is listening to this, he's going to break his heart, right? Because he, he I mean, I, I looked at one of his posts the other day and he said he was talking like he had to teach volcanoes as part of the curriculum. So what he did was he started off about his life and now he's gone and seen a volcano. And like he had the kids buying into the story. And by the end of it, like they knew their stuff because they were asking so many questions. You know, I mean, like when it's centralized, you take that element away, don't you? Like you almost kind of like are taking away the, the opportunity to, to inspire these kids because it's your passion and it's what you love doing. I mean, I think, I think it's crazy. Like what, what needs to change? Like, obviously you're, you're just like, you're doing, I mean, you're, you're, a big part of who you are now is the psychology, the psychology element of it. I mean, how important is it to change the way education is structured to make sure we get the best for these kids? Well, I think it's really important. I think it's really important. Um, it's really important. Um, but you know, the, the, it's not. It's really important, and uh, I wouldn't. I don't want to sit here and say it, it would be easy to do. But um, you know, if you accept the simple, you know, there's a simple, uh, there's a, a simple way of looking at education. Really, I, you know, I go into a classroom and I've got something that I've got in my mind, and I want to convey that to the minds of the students in front of me. It's a very, very simple, straightforward exchange. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I have to create a relationship whereby they trust me. Once they trust that actually I'm, I'm bringing something that, that they may be interested in, and that means that they have to be interested in me to some extent, they will then take what I have to offer. It's, it's no more complex than that. But what, because we're sort of afraid in a way of thinking of it in that way, and there's so much pressure on the system externally, you know, let's not forget schools are there to educate people in order to, for them to take place in society so what what is what what does our society want from our children you know what's the point of school so there's bigger questions because of these big questions all of this other stuff is loaded into this really really straightforward simple uh process it's a simple process teaching and once we if we can get to the sort of simplicity of it then maybe we can kind of reintroduce and reignite some of the passion around it, you know. So what needs to change? I think on a very simple, straightforward level, just equipping new teachers with an understanding that what they're doing in the room is creating a relationship with the students. And that is a primary task of a teacher. That's what they're there to do. And in my experience, teacher training doesn't, doesn't really do that. It may skirt it. It may say like, oh, yeah, well, that's what you're there to do and then forget it. Mm -hmm. But actually, we need to take a much more personal approach insofar as, you know, you are going to be there to make these children become interested and passionate about something. How can we help you with that? What might get in your way of you doing that? Um, and that means really introducing elements of what it is to be a human, what it is to be a person, what do people want from each other? Because teachers are frontline relators. That's what they are. They are at the very front line of creating relationships with students and with young people who are then going to move into society and then create something for the future. So it's really important that we get this personal aspect right very early on. So that's a, that would be a very simple change that I would make. Um, I, I just I just slightly reorganise the way we train teachers and probably just rethink what 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 a teacher's job is. What is it? What is that job really? Um, and it's to it is to create positive relationships. That's what it is. 
Yeah, I mean, that sounds quite obvious to me. I mean, like, it, it'd be quite common sense, right, to have something like that part of the PGCE. I mean, I, I, I mean, it doesn't, I know you've got, obviously, your, your education in, in the psychology of it, but, I mean, from somebody that doesn't have... Uh, <laughs> Like, it's not rocket science, right? So where, where do you think we're going wrong? Why isn't that something that's part of the system? I think we get scared. I think people get scared of psychology. When you hear the word psychology, and if I say to, if I say, well, what would be good would be if we had like a greater emphasis on the psychology of relationships. The moment you say that, the moment I say that, I can see people sort of shrink because they go, oh my God, psychology, uh, something something mysterious about that as though in a way it's kind of slightly dark arts mm. or belongs in a psychology classroom you know psychology belongs in a therapist room in a psychiatrist's couch or in a psychology classroom but actually psychology is me it's you well, it's everything yeah it's what it's you know it's the relationship that you yeah. and i have right now is is to some level we're, we're thinking our minds are kind of you know we're meeting it's a meeting of minds is what's going on so just, you know, I, I think I said to you when I, when I met you a few days ago that, you know, over 100 years ago, psychologist, there was a psychologist called Alfred Adler, and he said, look, if we don't teach teachers some basic psychology about how, pe how children tick and how, how they learn, and I don't mean how they learn an academic idea of how they learn, but how you as a person and your personal kind of psychology affects what's happening in the room, then we're on a hiding to nothing. And here we are, that was in 1911, and here we are in 2020. And it's still the same kind of like, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we want to think about relationships. I mean, relationships are the thing that drives all of us. You know, we all, that, that's the thing, that's, that's life, you know, that's what we want. And we have a relationship with learning, we have a relationship with one another. Let's just think of clearly about what that means. And it's not, we don't all have to kind of line up and lie down on Freud's couch. It's not that. It's very straightforward ideas about how children tick, what you might bring, what might get in your way. Um, and, and just take that as part of your toolbox. As you know, as you rightly said, you know, you're not a teacher, it's not rocket science. It's, it's very straightforward. Mm. And it needs to be thought of as very straightforward. And I think people get scared of it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously, like for me, it's quite obvious because when I was in year seven, I had a maths teacher that, I mean, I ended up, like, as soon as you went into year seven, I had the maths exam to determine what set I was going to be. And I ended up being in set three, which I was really disappointed about. And um, I remember thinking I was I was pretty thick, to be honest with you. Uh, but then my, my, my maths teacher in year seven, he literally inspired me, believed in me. And then I ended up getting an A in my GCSEs. I went up every year until year 10, I, I was in set one, and then I, I ended up getting my A. But that's all because of that one belief that he had in me and he inspired me. It's that relationship I had with him that kind of got me going in maths, you know. And um, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, is it? I mean, you no. talk to most. I mean, I'm an education recruiter, and most times when I speak to a graduate or a PhD student, like they were inspired by this one teacher that made them want to go to uh, teach it to the future generation, you know. Everybody, everybody, everybody can remember their favourite teacher. Yeah. Everybody, everybody knows the person in school, and everyone can remember the bad teacher too. But, you know, I've been, a, I've, I've, nobody wants to sit next to a teacher at a dinner party. That's what I was, that's what I was. <laughs> <laughs> until, until you ask them about their school experience. And then they've got so much to say about their, who their teacher or who they were. You know, there's something about that at those early years that we all know are incredibly uh, formative. We all know that. Mm. For me, it was a guy called Mr. Thomas. You know, when I was 10 years old, Mr. Thomas was somebody who was absolutely firm, fair and fun. You know, he was just, he was there. He knew the rules, he knew the boundaries, but you knew that he was there to help you. That's what he wanted. And all of the rules that he, that he put in place, as strict as he may have been, I'm not saying we shouldn't be kind of clear and boundary, we should. But understanding that, and I'm sure your math teacher did a similar thing, understanding, look, this is what we've got to do here. These are the boundaries in place so that we can get on with it. And I believe that you can absolutely achieve the best for yourself within this classroom. Mm. I mean, it, it's, it's, of course, easier said than done. But that's the, the very sort of straightforward job that we're in, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, teachers, like in some respects, you, you are salespeople, aren't you? You sell knowledge to the to your students and it's about all about your delivery and your pitch and if they're going to buy into it, right? And I always say that, it is, it's a form of sales. And you think about like, if this was a sales company, like a big corporate sales company, they'd be spending a lot of money in, in terms of investing in well, how their consumer psychologically works to make sure that they pitch it right to them, right? And it, it's insane. Why are we not doing it in education where it all begins, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you know that when you want to, when you buy something, you buy something from somebody you trust. You, you buy something because actually you think this this person isn't going to doesn't want to get one over on me. You know, he's got something that actually I'm going to find useful. That's a really straightforward and simple model for when I go in and teach Macbeth. You know, or when I teach anything, I've got something that actually I think is really going to be useful for the children to learn if they get that I think it's really useful for them and I set a boundary, I think that's really, really clear too. You do need some help with that. It's not like suddenly you're going to turn into, you know, Obama in the room, you know, and everyone's going to be hanging on your every word. Yeah. You've got to teach five hours a day. So it's every lesson. So there does need to be really kind of clear routines and things that help. So it's, it's a both and, but you're absolutely right. It's, trusting the product that I have to bring and you know what have I got that they that I believe is going to help them and then you know the thing is that children are naturally curious they want to learn that's another misnomer they are they sit in the room and they want to learn from you so it's a, just a matter of kind of allowing their fear to drop enough and sparking their curiosity if you can do that you're onto a winner yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, going back to the private sector, it's exactly the same. It's about, like, if people have money, they technically do want to spend it, you know? And it's about where do you want them to spend it? And it's, it's exactly the same thing with children in some respects. It's how engaging are you going to make it for them to want to buy from you? And um, it's it, like teaching profession is massively underappreciated because teachers do work really, really hard to make sure that they information across. I mean, in the best of years, let's, let's forget this year, but in the best of years, they work hard to try to achieve like the curriculum needs and the data entry and like the planning, the marketing, no holidays really. I know you get 30, 13 weeks off in a year, but like I'm sure four of those weeks, I mean, and nine of those weeks, you're still actually physically working, you know, and um, it, it, it's, a t it's a tough gig teaching. I mean, like this year, obviously your experience on psychology, I mean, how, are, how has COVID affected the impact I mean, how has it infect, impacted these children in terms of mindsets and like their possible future aspirations? Well, I think there's a couple of things to think about there. I think, I think, you know, I think it's not all bad. That's, I think it's not all bad. I think in terms of, you know, in terms of teaching, teaching, the pressure on teachers has been enormous. And I think one of the biggest things that they've had to cope with, apart from the just the logistical nightmare of our kids going to be in school how many are going to be in the class can i get on with the curriculum what am i going to teach them if i can't am i a teacher or am i a babysitter what is my <laughs> role you know the, the whole role has shifted i think and i think there's been an awful lot of um uh an awful lot of uh, and that's not really been very much very appreciated there's a notion that oh well actually a teacher is always a teacher well actually teach there's all loads of different things in a room one aspect of what they do is they keep children in that room and they kind of make sure that they don't go out into the corridor and do other things so containing your students in that room is kind of one aspect of what you're there to do and my my experience of what's happened this year is that that's been a, that that has been sort of one of the primary jobs how can we kind of monitor the logistics of what school currently is. Um, and that's, that's a slightly different emphasis, I think. I think actually uh, that's brought up an awful lot of challenges. I think one of the biggest problems of this year has been um, uncertainty. Now, you know, from, again, from a psychological point perspective, um, and you may know this from your own experiences at, you know, in sales, that anybody who is, uh, fearful or uncertain won't make a decision they would that you know they'll sort of stay where they are you know they'll stay in the same place because mm -hmm. actually they're, they're not quite sure what to do and i think uh, i think uncertainty has been an enormous problem because no one's been quite clear about what's next what to expect 
all of that. And I think that can be really emotionally stressful too, because, you know, as humans, we don't like uncertainty. We, we like things to be clear. We like to have direction. You know, uh, uncertainty is part of the kind of fear spectrum. And that, that kind of makes us kind of re react to things rather than respond to things. So um, I think that's been one of, the, one of the hardest things to cope with, the uncertainty of the whole situation. Uh, but it's not all been bad uh, either. You know, I, I was very lucky to interview and talk to some year 10 students and year 12 students about uh, and in sort of April time. And they were saying, you know what, sir, they call me sir still, you know what, so for the first time, I'm realising how much I like my teachers, how, what work they do, how much I enjoy school, how much I appreciate coming to school so a lot of those you know, and this wasn't like one or two this was kind of several classes of, of surveys that I carried out and they were saying well you know there's something about school we really miss because school is a place that's don't forget where is in a way it's like you going to your place of work you know you leave your house well we don't leave our houses so much anymore but <laughs> you leave your house you go to work and at work you're allowed to sort of have a different persona you step into a different role that you can be pleased and proud about. And I think, I think one of the things that comes out of COVID is that children have sort of had that idea that, well, at school, my teachers, you know, they're interested in me and it's not like to do with my parents and my home life. I get a chance to grow in school. Mm. And, and, I, and I think that's, you know, if anything good comes out of this, I think one of the good things will be, the children will really appreciate what's the good aspects of school. And that actually there will be a movement where, you know, some simple things around kind of kindness will, will actually become more central in the curriculum, kindness, warmth, human relationships, the value of, uh, of coming together. Uh, my, my hope is that that will become more kind of formalized in, in the school system. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard, I, I understand what you're saying, and I hope so. I mean, that, that in an ideal world, that would be amazing. But I think it's, I find it's 100% hard to believe because I think even when I see social media and I see people trolling the profession and stuff, and it's like, look, we've got all this stuff happening. Why aren't we there just to support each other? And I, I know, obviously, we can do so much for these children, but there will obviously, you can only take the horse to the lake, you can't make the horse drink the water, right? There's only so much you can physically do. Um, but yeah. I mean, but the problem is, obviously, the, the the gap between the advantage and disadvantage will keep growing, you know. And I think oh, yeah. the, from the roots of education, we, we need to have a bit of a system that is going to help develop the disadvantage and, and make sure that they're not falling behind as much. I mean, this, this year has highlighted the biggest, how, how big the gap is and how, how much further it's getting. I mean, what, what do we need to implement from an early age or early development in, in teaching um, to make sure that we are getting doing the best for not only the advantaged children, but the, these disadvantaged children too? Well, that's an enormous question, isn't it? Because the big, the, the, I mean, the thing that comes to mind straight away is, you know, you'd have to abolish private education. <laughs> Why? Because actually you, you, you're starting from a very uneven playing field if you're allowing certain sections of the community to kind of take their children off and, and educate them privately. Um, so uh, I, I think it just makes, you know, it makes absolute sense to kind of not to allow that to happen. Now I can't see that happening uh, over the next 10 years or 50 years because f for various reasons, but I suppose, you know, the only, the answer, the, this very straightforward answer is funding resources. Uh, you know what what has what this has brought about, hasn't it? It's like it's okay saying go home and go on your computer and download the resources. Well, you know I'm a governor in a school in North London, and a lot of the work that we were doing in that school very early on was actually just getting round one providing food parcels for people who could no longer access food in school. Mm -hmm. So making sure that they got their lunches. And the other thing was providing uh, laptops uh, for those children to download anything. They had no means in order to do it. And I, and I suppose the third thing was a lot of the, the children at that end of the spectrum have got no private space in which to work either. So 
that's an enormous disparity from a lot of the other children in the same school who are like, oh yeah, I'm loving it because actually I'm allowed to, you know, I can go to my room and I can, and great for them. But um, yeah, it has in, entirely highlighted that and that has to change. But that is, that is a, you know, that is a question, that is a question of one facing up to the reality of what we're trying to do in schools. There is a, there is a misnomer, I think, that actually, because all of the children are at school somehow, everyone has an equal shot <laughs> you know it's like well actually that's not the case yeah absolutely not you know, it's not the case um you know the other thing that I, the, the other thing that i do is i sometimes sit on behavior panels uh when uh, in school and, and i'm lucky enough or unlucky enough if you like to have children come to to those behavior panels and 10 times out of 10 those children are children who are from backgrounds where one's not surprised that, the, that there are behavior issues going on. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's, again, they are, it's not rocket science and yet it is denied. I think there is a sort of a, a sense where you're being naughty. Why is it? Because this Alfred isn't being naughty. Well, Alfred's parents went to university and they have, you know the value of education and this boy or this girl, doesn't have that it's a single parent blah 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 so you know you know what i'm saying so it's not what schools show up is the disparity in, in in society as much as anything and the kind of expectation that schools somehow will be able to kind of bridge the gap that actually society isn't willing to look at yeah and that's the same, isn't it? I mean, almost like, and, and this is, again, this is a, what, one of the reasons why we've, why I started this podcast is to celebrate what teachers are doing because when you're, when, I, when I've heard these stories, when I've had people like Omar Darion, who's the head teacher at Cumberland School, or Dee Conlon, the head teacher of Sir Gib, uh, Frederick Gibbard College in Harlow, they talk about like how they've been there, like supporting these kids, providing them meals, like standing outside, like uh, asking for donations or like getting vouchers for these kids. Like you talk about, this is, this isn't their job, you know, this isn't, also, this is the UK. Where, where are we that actually this is happening? Yeah. This is supposed to be, you know, a first world country with a top class education system, you know, where everyone gets an even chance. What, what's going on? You know, what's happening? Absolutely. You know, and, and these kids, like, they've obviously, I understand, obviously, you can't please everyone. I understand that. But we've got to try as a community, surely. I mean, we, we like you said, we're in a first world country. We're not in a third world country. I mean, like, they, they talk about the... I mean, what do we pay taxes for? What do we pay NHS, we pay education. I mean, we pay all these X amount of taxes every year. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of tax bills that I was like, whoa, I'm getting taxed this much. I mean, like Rain, Wayne Rooney, when he was on 300 grand, was paying 30 million pound in taxes a year. Where does this money go? You know, I mean, like, I, it, it, it's great. That the, some, like, they're doing some work, but these children need it, you know, and these schools need more support. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, where do you start from, though? You know, that, that's the problem. I mean, well, I tell you what, I tell you what, I tell you what. I think part of the issue is with that is that we're sort of slightly obsessed with good news. I think that, that I think we've 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 evolved a system whereby you can only ever really present good news. You can't really present bad news. And what I mean by that is we need to get a real picture of what's happening rather absolutely. than rather than a picture where everybody has to say how well it's going. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know what experience you've had of sitting on committees, but I've sat on lots of committees where the role of the committee is to kind of analyse or feed back into the organisation how the organisation is doing. But often the information that you're presented as part of that committee is only good news. So actually you think, well, hold on a minute, it can't all be good news. There has to be something here that actually you're trying to, you know, bury under the, under the, under the positive news that you're giving us i mean i get it if if you're you know if you're trying to maybe if you're trying to sell computers it's different i don't know but we're not we're dealing with people's lives here so yeah. what is the reality of the picture if we took a snapshot what does the snapshot look like and what can we now do to kind of a, to kind of address that and i do think we're slightly obsessed now in a target driven uh, environment to only present things when they're going well and when things aren't going well actually it's it's kind of it's not accepted by the system but it's kind of put onto kind of individuals or it's they're not quite doing their job properly or da -da 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 -da. 
Mm. So I think that's part of the problem. I think it's a cultural, it's, there's a cultural, cultural thing there that needs to be addressed. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to work with some head teachers who are very, very, very good at doing that. But they are often find themselves kind of working against a cultural model that says, well, why do you keep bringing us these problems? And they're saying, well, I'm bringing you the problems because there's, this is really what's happening, what really needs to be solved. So I think that's, I think that's part of the problem. And you know what? I mean, the challenge. I, I think I think we've um, we've spoken about it in previous podcasts actually, but in I think one of the big, big issues is that the education secretary changes every eighteen to twenty four months. And, and 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 realistically, what what changes can you implement in two years? I mean, a government comes into power for four years and they don't even hit targets that they're expecting to hit. So um, with a lifespan of two years in the like for an education secretary, how can you find? Like, I mean, they're not going to be someone that really wants to make a difference. You know, it's a, it's a stepping stone or a side stepping stone, or it's not it's not their passion. You know, do we like, do we need somebody that's from education to really want to come in and make a difference in? that's it i agree i well i agree entirely i think education should be taken out of the out of the remit of the i mean the bank of england is a good example isn't it you know just take that out of the uh, remit of changing politicians because education is always used like a political football and it's used that way because uh people feel because one everyone's been to school and loads of people have got kids so there is uh, there is a sense that actually well we all know about education because we've all been to school so uh so what happens is, you know, new, I'm sure as you've discussed before, another politician comes along and they know that they can kind of spark uh, headlines if they, um, they can spark headlines and get interest if they can say something about schools, about teachers, about, you know, because that's part of some people's everyday experience. But that in itself is, is, is nearly criminal, actually. I mean, it's tantamount to actually really ignoring what we're trying to do when we educate the young people of our country. We're trying actually to provide some sense of what do we want from the education system? What are we, what's the requirement in a way? What, what are we building when we kind of br bring a young person in? What's, what do we want for them? And how can we embed that over the next 20 years rather than like change it every two years? So yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree entirely. It, yeah. and, and obviously you talk about psychology of re building relationships um, uh, and it's, it, whether it be with a teacher and, and obviously a pupil or whether it be t uh, with your employer and an employee. Um, I mean, in some respects, teachers are employees of the government, you know, and you talk about the psychological um, sort of uh, relationship that you need to have to build strong relationships and to, to work together. And ultimately with this broken relationship there, that there is between education and politicians, I mean, it, there's no, I mean, it's quite obvious where, where, why it's broken, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's where it all stems from it, doesn't it? I mean, they're not always getting, you know, for me, when, when I kind of look, look at it from a neutral point of view, I see teachers so passionate about wanting to make a difference to these kids' lives. And then like from the top, they're, they're not getting the support. So you kind of like, it's like running with one leg, you know, like you, you're, not, you're not giving the right support to be able to, to, to compete at the top level and, and do the best for your children. Um, again, there's no real right answer, but again, this is what this podcast is about to, to highlight what teachers are having to do, you know, and, and, and the remarkable work that they are doing. Um, like, is there anything that you really want to add to, to obviously the conversation we've had? Like, is there something that you really want to highlight about the teacher profession at the moment? Well, I mean, you said, you said, you said some of it there. I think, you know, I've never met, you know, in all the years I was teaching, I never met many if any teachers who weren't trying their absolute best to um to do the work that they've been they'd been assigned to do and it's weird that i have to say that but i'm saying that because actually there is a there is a notion somehow that i think teachers i think teachers get blamed for systemic problems i think you know in a way you've said it that you know it's easy to go well you know, let's employ a teacher and if they can't actually cut it, if they can't cut the classroom, then it must be there. It must be to do with them. They're not cut out for the job. And I think one of the things that needs to happen is the system needs to take some responsibility for the way it thinks about and treats the teachers as a professional. You know, when you go into teaching, 
there is a, you know, there's a recruitment policy. You may know more about this than me, but there is a recruitment policy as far as I can see is let's just keep feeding the teachers in from this end. Let's keep feeding them in. And if they can't cope, let's throw them out. Let's just kind of throw them out that end. Bless you. Throw them out that end. So, you know, but actually, you know, the line of teachers who want to join the profession is getting much shorter. Yeah, that's, that's it. So you can't do that. You know, at some point, very soon, and if not right now, and I think there is change happening right now, some point you're going to have to go, but what is it we're doing to them that makes it so difficult to keep them in the profession? My daughter's 24, 25, and she's got several friends who've gone into teaching through Teach First or through various other means, and, and very few of them have stayed in the profession. And a lot of them are really wonderful young people who absolutely adore the kids and being in the room and being in those relationships. But the moment they step out of the classroom, they're finding it very difficult to get um, uh, emotional support or, or find systems whereby they can sort of express what's, what they're finding difficult. The whole way it's set up is... Yes, it is difficult, but if you can't quite deal with it, it must be something to do with you. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think it's time to kind of own up uh, in, a, in, um, in a really open way about actually what are we doing to these young people who are coming into the system and how can we support them more? And in terms of what else I might want to add to the conversation is I think one of the reasons that I focus so much on relationships and on, on on kind of think helping teachers think about the relationship they have with themselves and with the pupils in the room. I think ultimately, you know, my, my dream would be that if you can really educate teachers to think about what's happening between in themselves and between them and the students, that's incredibly empowering because what you are able then to do is get rid of a lot of the stuff that's troubling you and put it in a place where you understand it. You get the psychology of it. It's no longer to do with you. You stop self-blaming. You stop shaming yourself. You stop kind of going into a difficult place. And you go, well, actually, that's not my stuff. That belongs here. And then you allow, once you do that, you can really free up your attention. Now, imagine if we could do that on a, on a national scale where we actually allow teachers to really understand what's going on, compartmentalize the stuff that's happening to them emotionally, and then get them thinking clearly. The moment you clear away these troubling emotions, you're able to go, bang, this is what we need to do. Hmm. Now, if you can do that for however many hundreds of thousands of teachers there are in this country, education will change because they will start demanding that actually it's time to shift this thing on. And the top, are struggling to do that because they've got pressures coming. Um, so I think ultimately these things, if they are to happen, need to be pushed up from the, you know, from the groundswell underneath. And that's, that's really tough right now because teachers are very much caught up in the doing of teaching. And teaching is about doing, but the big thing about being a teacher is who you are. Mm. It's about being at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, you don't get into teaching for the money, do you? You do it to make a difference. And, and, that's, and that's the problem sometimes is obviously politicians don't completely understand that. You know, I think obviously politicians, whether they go into politics for the right reasons, don't always end up saying in politics for the right reasons, you know. And whereas teachers, like to, to be a teacher for 20 years, to be in that classroom, to be dedicated, to try to make a difference, to see, um, uh, to have emotional attachments for five years with your form and then to see them leave and then to build another attachment. It's heartbreaking. It's, it's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you said at the beginning, when you're first getting into teaching, you're standing in front of a group of 30 kids, they don't know you. I mean, it's one of the most daunting things. I mean, I had to do it once on an enrichment day at Art Bridge Free school and i was pooing my pants i, I mean it's quite <laughs> scary isn't it um and especially when the kids don't know you i mean and not only are you doing that but then you you're working crazy hours in the evening and you're planning you're marking and that goes on and that goes on and you don't get paid a lot for it you know you, you know it's it's insane because for the hours that you end up doing if you're working in a corporate environment you'd be earning a lot more money and and it and you're educated you know like you have to get yeah. into the profession so it, it blows my mind I respect it as as much as it should yeah. be yeah, me too, mate. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. But I mean, let's let's. I mean, I, I haven't got rose tinted glasses by any means. I've been in teaching long enough to know what it's really what it's like. 
Yeah. Uh, but part of the joy, why, in my, in my view, why, why I stayed in teaching for so long is you see, you see transformation and you see it every day. You see children sort of fall in love with something that you're teaching in a class. You see lights go on. You see, uh, it's fun and it's funny. And the great thing about children of any age is they will always tell you the truth. They will, they'll tell you what they believe is their truth anyway. And they'll tell it to your face. You know, they won't, uh, they won't go behind your back. And I, and I know lots of adults, but lots of adults don't want to do that. Mm. One of the great thing about being a teacher is if you're in a room and you're great, a teach, the kids will say, it was a really great lesson. And if you're in a room and the lesson's not going so well, they'll say, that was really boring. So. Yeah. So, and there's something, there's something about that that's very simple and very straightforward and very, un, um, very uncomplicated. Uh, and when you see kids go from year seven through to year 11 and then through to year 13 uh, and, you know, they do something, you know, you, it, it is a parental role teaching. It is, you, you see the, that, that transformation or that change and it's not always good, but very, very often it is good. And to feel that you're part of that, to feel that you've created a relationship with that child whereby they've trusted you and you've moved them on, and they've moved you on too. You're learning, let's not forget. Teachers who stop learning often are the ones who are most unhappy. But um, there's something fantastic about it too, and, and it's, that's really hard to see right now, I, I think, particularly for young teachers, for new teaching. I think that's yeah. really difficult. It's shame. Really, um, I think that's a shame. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just like obviously statistics do show that within teaching, uh, within the first four years, they like a lot of teachers do leave the industry, and it's a shame. And that's and that's again, I mean, there's there's amazing people out there like Sarah Bramwell and Rebecca Daniels and Sonata Bagri who who are really focused on teacher well being. And and I think we need kind of things like with what you're doing, with what they're doing to and even in some respects, what I'm doing with this podcast to kind of make sure that we are, we are that kind of focusing on teacher wellbeing and focusing on the appreciation of what they're doing, because it's like with anything, if, if you put your heart and soul into anything and you don't feel appreciated, you're going to just like give up on it eventually, aren't you? You know? And, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was, what I was reading yesterday about the power of acknowledgement and the power the, the simple power of acknowledging that somebody's doing a good job. So, you know, most, uh, you know, according to lots of, um, research, very straightforward acknowledging that somebody's doing well is the greater incentive for lots of people than finance you know just to say you're doing a great job really appreciate what you're doing i really value what you're doing such simple things can make an enormous difference uh, and providing spaces where teachers can offload offload with one another in a very kind of straightforward way providing spaces where they can do yoga keep fit um things that actually address their personal lives because per the teaching as i said to the other day teaching is a personal business you share yourself and you share your subject knowledge too but it's your you're the powerhouse in a way of what's happening in the room i mean the kids obviously provide lots of the energy but it's it's keeping yourself clear and mentally and physically kind of able to do that job and that and space being made for that in the system that's really essential i think almost like where the government needs to give schools more, more of a budget to be able to focus on, on that in some respects, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And bring in specialists in order to, uh, specialists in order to do that. Or, I mean, the big thing that I'm pushing at the moment is peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentoring. So allow some of your teachers to go out of school and learn how to be, how to peer mentor one another, not in how to deliver better maths, but how to uh, think about the way you're feeling before you go into a room and what can be done? How can we think about that in a way so that when you walk into that room, you're not feeling all of the things that are going to get in the way of your teaching. And these are just very, very simple things. Now I read the other day and um, about the sort of the, the, um, uh, the uh, emotional benefits of just simply saying how you telling somebody else, how you feel about something, just saying it out loud. The moment actually you, you do that, you take it out of it being something that's threatening and you bring it out into the open and just saying it actually then begins to ignite another side of your brain, which is then a side that allows you to rationally think about what you're saying. A very, very simple technique is to 
let's create a space where people can say that in a safe environment. In order to do that, you need to begin to educate certain staff members to be able to kind of facilitate those groups. And it's not, as we keep saying, it's not rocket science and it shouldn't be feared. It's very straightforward. And let's begin to think about the psychology in a very straightforward way. We're humans. It's, it's part of who we are. Let's accept who we are. This is how we function. This is how we tick. So Absolutely. how can we really understand that? Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's kind of acknowledging the problem and then addressing it, isn't it? I mean, if a school was failing, you'd get a, a, a super head to come in, come help fix the school and, and then learn about the school, then do the psychology on it and, and see what's going to work and implement new strategies. Why are we not doing that in a broken education system is beyond me. But um, but look, I mean, I think ultimately, we should, obviously, we've had a lot to talk about and, and I think we should probably leave it there. But I mean, you've given us such a good insight and, and your views on, on education and how things are. So, I mean, I can't I can't thank you enough to for, for coming on, Steve. And uh, yeah, really my pleasure. Man. I hope I didn't ramble on too much. Um, no, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's very insightful. Yeah. So thank, thank you man. so yeah. much for coming on. Yeah, good. And, and good luck to, to all of you teachers out there. You're doing a fantastic, fantastic job with respect to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone.